welcome to MacroHive Conversations with Bilal Hafiz. MacroHive helps educate investors and provide investment insights for all markets from crypto to equities to bonds. For our latest views, visit MacroHive.com. So greetings, Michael. It's excellent to have you on our podcast show. It's a pleasure. Now, before we go into our proper conversation, I do like to ask all of our guests something about their origin story. You know, what did you study at university? And was it inevitable you'd end up following the path that you have in academia, consulting and beyond? Um, just to begin things on an upbeat note, the only inevitability I see is death. So uh, no, there was nothing inevitable about the path that I chose. In terms of origin story, um, I will make a full confession. I grew up in Chicago's Hyde Park, University of Chicago. I am a faculty brat. Um, dad was a scientist. Mom was a, was a fundraiser for the Cancer Research Foundation. So I have all of the intellectual strengths and emotional shortcomings of somebody who grew up in an academic household in an academic environment. That said, I do like sport and I'm not bad at it, but, but um, that's who I was intellectually. I studied at Illinois, Champaign, and at MIT. I was a computer science and economics major, always interested in AI kind of issues, very interested in history of economic thought, for the not for quantitative reasons, but I was fascinated by the notion of value, value creation, new value creation, innovation, and how that value gets fairly allocated. So history of economic thought, uh, a little bit back into the pre-economic days of you know when economics was because you went to. Cambridge political economy, you know, sort of the classic PPE, which of course we don't have in America at all. I'll I'll, I'll stop there, but you know, as you can sense, mm -hmm. I can go on both ad infinitum and ad absurdum on these issues. And why did you pick computer science and economics? Was that a common combination to do in your day, or it, uh, so why did you do that combination? It was not a common combination. Um, I wanted to have a better balanced quant background. Um, I had been exposed to computers, hobbyist computers, Altair and MSI computers in the 70s. I actually worked for one of the first personal computer hobby shops in suburban Chicago. I read a book called Computer Lib Dream Machines by a lunatic, a brilliant lunatic and visionary by the name of Ted Nelson, Theodore Nelson. I felt that computers represented a really interesting playground. And one had to have insights into algorithms to make that playground not just fun, but useful. But I thought economics would be a useful dialogue for value creation, value exploration, value discovery, um, and insight. So uh, that was that was kind of my interest. I was interested in economic mechanisms, and software seemed like a very interesting way of enabling and testing mechanism design. That's a great point. And I do think economics doesn't really understand software that well at all. Um, there's been some literature in recent years about intangible, uh, intangible capital goods, and so cetera. on, but it's just a part of economic, there's a bit of a blind spot, uh, you know, in it's, terms of understanding that. It's really interesting that you, you, you say that because to go back to economic slash capital and capitalism, I became very interested in the notion of financial capital, human capital, social capital, reputational capital. Now, admittedly, some of these prefixes are, are a bit jokey terms, but, but the, the notion of, of how technology transforms how we construct and deconstruct capital you know, was revelatory. And if you'll forgive my name dropping, when I came out of school and came to New York, 
like all ambitious Midwesterners, you go to one coast or the other, and my driver's license had been taken away, so I came to New York, I had the opportunity to meet Fisher Black and Myron Scholes and Bob Merton, the son of the, the historian of science, the philosopher of science, and was exposed to the Black-Scholes equation, which was used to, de in economic terms, deconstruct and identify arbitrage opportunities. But guess what? It could also become a production methodology. The only way that was possible was via computing platforms, compute. So this was, the, to me, a convergence of my interests. Yeah, that's a great, great sort of background there. And this leads us on nicely, actually, to some some of the work that you've done over the years. One that's really stood out to me and why I actually reached out to you was your work on what you call recommendation engines. And this is something I've, once, once I've read your book, it's obvious, and we should all think about this. And I'm, I'm really surprised that this isn't more discussed in, in the way you discuss it. But perhaps for the benefit of of our audience, I mean, can you talk about what you mean by recommendation engines and what makes them special um, for for well, study? I'm 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 glad that you said that. I'm flattered because because to me, one of my forgive me KPIs, key performance indicators, is I really like it after somebody reads something that I wrote or engages in something that I did. They say, "Well, this is obvious." You know, I mean, I, of course, I would love subtlety and profundity in there, but but I, I, I do think the blindingly obvious merits particular attention. The the recommender story is 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 a, is an interesting one because it goes back to the computer science, laptops, devices, etc. Um, economics. I was very heavily influenced as I graduated. You know, I felt macro was between you and me a bit of a joke. I felt micro was really, really interesting, but in a formalism way, um, I became much more interested in, this will not surprise you at all, again, University of Chicago, behavioral economics, choice architectures, Richard Thaler, Cass Sunstein. I think choice architecture is one of the greatest juxtapositions in economics semantics, ontology, psychology, computer science, Iran. Um, so I'm very interested. I, I, I look at myself. Do you know what I really like? I am not looking for, when you give me the, a, a, a problem or a challenge, my immediate reaction is not, how do I overcome the challenge or, or solve the problem? That, that's not me. My immediate reaction is, what are my choices? What are the best choices? I am much more interested in the best choices rather than the best answer. My view is I'm going to have more confidence in the best answer if I've been exposed to the best choices. Now, with that background, it should be immediately clear why recommender systems were so interesting. Here I am, I'm playing on Amazon. Here I am, I'm playing on LinkedIn. Here I am, I'm playing on, I swear to God, I was on the board of Match.com, okay? Oh, really? Uh, I wouldn't yeah, have expected uh, that. <laughs> I, 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 that's a curveball. So a uh, slight digression, through an unusual set of circumstances, I got to know Barry Diller, and I did some work for Mr. Diller, who I like, and he is quite a character. And instead of paying me for the work. He invited me to be on the board of a couple of his IAC companies, and Match was one of those companies. So uh, <clears throat> uh, were you that, ever a consumer of that product? I was not a consumer of that product. And I'm saying that not just because of the chance my wife may hear this, but because it happens to be true. I was not a user. But but let me tell you, there were all manner of interesting things, and I don't think I'm speaking out of school here, because one of the problems with Match.com was that we would get people's credit card information, but in the course of running credit checks, we would sometimes, we, it's not me, it was the management, would discover that some of the people on Match.com were married. And they were not disclosing this. So what were our ethical fiduciary obligations? So talk about choice architectures and, and business models here. What, what do you do on, on, on this? 
we'll, we'll put that off to the side, but the overarching point and insight is how can simple or complex algorithms matched with greater and better data transform the value and optionality of choice architectures, okay? And you looked at Amazon, you looked at TikTok, you looked at, at uh, 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 LinkedIn, you looked at all of these, you looked at Netflix and, you know, the Netflix place, you looked at all of these either born digital or digitally transformed organizations. And the idea that they could be as effective, successful, uh, uh, um, reliable, valuable as they were divorced from recommender systems, divorced from recommendation engines, divorced from innovations in, in choice architecture was ridiculous. I myself was astonished. I mean, we're in financial services. I was astonished that the Schwabs of the world, the UBSs of the world, the Ameritrades of the world did not explore and exploit recommender systems, you know, investments for people like you, people who invested in this category or stock also invested in this. Yes, 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 I understand that there are proprietary and privacy sort of issues here, but, but I would have thought that people in finance would have been clever enough to build a wall between a, a, you know, something that says this is what you should buy versus exposing people to better choices. Y using recommender systems, back to Econ 101, revealed preference. What do people really want? Let's give people the opportunity to create a virtual portfolio. How about multiple virtual portfolios? So this got me to the to the point that what recommender systems and recommender in, in recommendation engines were really about were about the future of advice. They were about the future of advice. How do you give people better choices? How do you give people, and demonstrably so, how do you give people choices that they can see themselves in? And then with a bit of nuance and a twist, how can you give people choices and choice architectures that let them become more of who they want to be and less of who they would really rather not be. So this is the notion of not just digital transformation, but self-transformation. And I felt advice and recommendation and suggestion was key and integral to that. They're called recommendation engines, not compliance engines. That is not a subtle distinction. It's a profound distinction. And, and going back to the origins of the book, I realized that I would have that, that I had to do more in this area because I hit a stage in my late 20s and early 30s when I was using my devices more than my friends to get advice whether for restaurants or books or music. It's not that I didn't have good friends and they didn't give me good advice. I just found these recommender systems did, if you'll forgive my vulgar language, a pretty bloody good job. <laughs> and actually that, that, I mean, there's just two things I wanted to pull out there. First of yeah. all, the way you talked about recommendations, you linked it to identity and self-transformation, you know, these kind of quite, Exactly. High elevating sort of concepts. Um, so, so there's something deeper about these than at first sight what these are. It's not just a simple, I want to buy more this or that. It's something bigger than that. Right. Well, but, 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 but hold on. I mean, this is, this is, and you know, what, it, what is the great accusation against the social media companies like uh, the TikTok, ByteDance and, and, and Twitter, now X, and Facebook, now Meta, it's, it's clickbait. Where do you draw the line between self-indulgence and self-investment? I think that's a great line to draw. I think that's a great debate to have. We'll go back again to Econ 101. What's the indifference curve between where I invest in improving how I feel for the moment versus improving who I am for the future? I mean, 
what, good Lord, that's the kind of question I want to be involved with. Those are the sorts of answers I want to be involved with. My argument is, I don't think you can give great answers or even good ones without making a commitment to algorithmic innovation, to AI, to better data. And the platforms from that, the origin story for that, <clears throat> you know, with apologies to the Oracle of Delphi or, or um, you know, the I Ching, the origins of that really are recommender systems and recommendation engines. And I suppose that's, that, you know, behind that lies this idea of to have a good recommendation engine, it should have something around self-improvement, something that makes you uh, become well, something that you strive to be or... That's me. That okay? Let's be let's be very clear here. We're having if we're having a trillion dollar conversation on 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 this because it's easy to imagine. You know that the the fentanyl industry, the drug industry, has done pretty good with you know immediate gratification. You know, getting a hit, getting a high, and and of course that's the big social criticism of social media that it's about immediate gratification, instant gratification. Um, if I may pay you the compliment, clearly you're, you're concerned, not just with momentum trades or trades in the moment, you're, you're interested in investment, longer term investment. Now we can debate what longer term means, but yes, but that is a bias. That's a business model bias. Should, should do you seek to optimize the moment? I mean, what do you seek to optimize when you, when you get advice or recommendation, what are you seeking to optimize? the next minute, the next decision, your, your future self, six months, six years down the road. I mean, all of a sudden, these seemingly simple questions become remarkably complex. My view is when I'm dealing with remarkable complexity, I want better choices. Where do those better choices come from? We're full circle. I want a recommender. I want good friends but I want good recommenders. And now on friends, the second guy I want to put this idea of asking friends for advice versus, yeah. versus a recommender. So, you know, what, one of the things about friends is you trust them, you've known them for years, they know you, they're part of your social group. I mean, why, why, why can they not give better recommendations compared to the algorithms? Well, they do give, give well, they, they do give good recommendations. I mean, I, I think that, it would be a really interesting counterpart to the Turing test to get blind or anonymized recommendations and see whether the recommendations you think one thinks are better come from one's self-described friends versus one's recommender systems. I think that is a great social experiment that has yet to be done. It certainly could be done at scale, et cetera. I, I am not embarrassed to tell you that I have talked with a couple of friends who I've known for over two decades and asked them to send me what does Amazon recommend or Goodreads, what are their book recommendations? What are their Spotify lists on this? So in a perverse sort of way, I have disintermediated my human friend in favor of their recommendation engine. Is that, is that wrong? Oh, oh, same thing with Netflix on, on that. I, I shouldn't leave out the Netflix side on this. I, I, there are times when I say, what are you watching? You know, and, and by the way, there's a second order effect there because the reason why they're watching that on Netflix is because it popped up on the recommender there. So, so I mean, it is sort of interesting. Do I want, to what extent do I want to disintermediate my friends in favor of their recommender systems? That would make me quite the exploiter, wouldn't it? But, but that's the, but, 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 but again, let's put it into your industry terms, you know, which is uh, um, tell me why you invested in something versus show me your investments. You know, to what extent can I reverse engineer your risk appetite from seeing the way you have chosen to manage several portfolios. That's the kind yeah. of, that, you know, to what extent are recommend, oh, oh, and I'm now, sorry, I'm, I'm going on a rant here, but, but notice what I've left out, which needs to be put in. 
What I really need to know is not just what's on your recommender system, but which are the recommendations that you chose to follow? What's the advice you chose to follow? What are the suggestions you chose to follow versus the ones you ignored? So what I want is that kind of, I'll make a very bad joke, sharp ratio between, between or better, better confusion matrix, between the recommendations that were followed and the recommendations that were ignored. And I'll go one step further. What an interesting conversation it has to your to have with your friend saying, well, gee, this band is consistently recommended for your music list, but you never listen to them. Why not? Why do you not like the band, even though it's recommended? Why do you not like the show, even though it's recommended? So you learn as much from the advice people choose to ignore as from the advice and recommendations people choose to embrace. To me, that represents a different form of intimacy and insight, which frankly, I think is pretty important. Absolutely. And and we've been talking about recommendation engines and obviously they have a history themselves. Exactly. Um, what, I mean, I mean, can we trace it back to the beginning? Is there like the first ever recommendation engine or? Well, there, there, there was Grundy, which was a library recommendation engine in the late seventies. Um, to, as, as I mentioned in the book, and as I mentioned elsewhere, you know, uh, what Patty Ma's group was doing at the Media Lab at MIT when I was there was interesting. It was Firefly, and we had Homer, which is a music recommendation mission, I think. And, and um, they, th this group actually struck a deal with, just to, just to date it, with Barnes & Noble. And... <laughs> This so disoriented the young Amazon that they struck a deal with a couple of University of Minnesota folks who launched Net Perceptions. Um, I needn't say who did better under those circumstances, but uh, you know that was sort of the origins of, of of these things. You know, and it wasn't collaborative filtering; it was item to item filtering, you know, item, people who bought items like this because of compute limitations. So it was, you know, people who bought this also bought this, as opposed to people like you, people who bought, people like you also bought stuff like this. So there's collaborative filtering, filtering, which interestingly require, doesn't require you to have any understanding of the product at all, just like for like, and, and, you know, same thing with items, it's all correlative on this. What's interesting, and this is the profound insight that leads to things like large language models and transformers and chat GPT, is the quest for similarity. Similarity is the key underlying and organizing principle for effective recommendation. What is the, forgive me, matrix of similarities that matter most? The individual, the item, the experience, the attribute. When one talks about deep learning and, and embeddings, you know, what one is, what one is talking about converting these, these uh, features and items into vectors and vector space. And what is the proxy for similarity and vector space? How close are they? Okay, close, you know, we're back to, to uh, Pythagorean theorem, you know, Euclidean distance. What are the closest things? You know, the closest things are more likely to be more similar. So the dimensionality of similarity, understanding a new, forgive the use of this word, ontology and semantics of similarity and machine learning, learning what people consider similar, related or not, that's what makes transformers transformative that's the kind of pattern match that's going on that's why i think people who describe chat gpt and llms as stochastic parrots either have incredibly intelligent parrots or really don't know what they're talking about that's great no, i like that i like that all and and so uh, i mean do you think there's any sectors that cannot use recommendation engines or is, is it almost like every sector you can imagine can use it? Um, I would 
So you know what light bulb jokes are, right? Yeah. yeah. So one of my friends, who is a friend for over 30 years, um, he, he asked people in job interviews to come up with a light bulb joke for themselves. He created a light bulb joke for me. He said, how many Michael Schrags does it take to screw on a light bulb? And the punchline is, you're asking the wrong question. <laughs> you know, so that, that, that's mine. Um, I think you're asking the wrong question. I think in any industry, in any field of human or machine or societal engagement and interaction, where does advice, where does suggestion, where does choice matter? If you can identify where choices matter, you can find a recommend the need, a market for a recommender system or a recommendation engine. To me, one of the great, and now I'm going to sound like a, a pseudo-intellectual, like the academic pseudo-intellectual people fear or expect, which is I think the great quantitative tension that goes on because of our enormous, enormous, enormous terabytes of data, petabytes of data and, and compute is how do we optimize things? What is the answer? What is the answer? How do we have, we have complexity? What's the optimal path? I think optimization is the enemy. I want better choices, not better optimization. Okay. Or more accurately, before we talk about optimization, can we please talk about choices, better choices? Given what we know, what are the best choices, the five best choices, the seven best choices, you know, given human cognitive constraints? Or am I simply outsourcing decision to the algorithm? Am I, am I willingly turning myself into a meat puppet? I don't want to think about it. Let's have the algorithm decide. I think that's the great tension that's occurring. Where do we optimize? Where do we outsource? Where are the better choices? Where do we make the better choices? What does agency mean when all of the machines we work with are smarter than we are? And by optimization, you mean like a, a single answer to all that's the correct. problem? Yes. Yeah. So yeah. that's the, the trade off. Like do we want yeah. to just be given something on the plate or do we want to have some level of agency in make it was one of the most choices? Interesting exchanges I had with the Netflix people. You know, there were people in the Netflix data science group that basically didn't want to give people choices. They said, we should be so good that you should just want to watch what we tell you to watch. You know, so they're not interested in a choice architecture. It's a one choice architecture which I consider, I won't use the F word, fascism, but I consider that to be totalitarian, you know, a total, it's a totalitarian, quote, recommender, you know, you hear your choices. Actually, no, here's your choice. And let's map it into your world. You know, if you're, if you, if, if you spent time with a client and then you gave the client the portfolio, the answer, the recommendation, and, and that's it, that's, that's it. Is, is does that enable or facilitate the kind of relationship you want with a client? Is it, is it, is it, you know, you talk to the doctor, the doctor writes out a prescription or sends you in for an operation, or is there a dialogue? Do you get a sense of your, dare I use the statistical phrase, degrees of freedom before you make a choice? Okay. What does, and now forgive me for going slightly legal on this, but you'll completely, and anybody listening to this will completely get it. What does informed consent mean in this environment? And now we're back to the notion of transparency, interpretability, explainability of those recommenders. And you go back to what you asked me about 15, 18 minutes ago in terms of my friends. I trust my friends. I trust my friends to look out for my best interests, not just for their best interests. Okay. I don't need 
uh, uh, too much transparency, but I absolutely want their recommendations to be explained and interpretable to me. That's the kind of bonds we, we have. But these are the kinds of choice architecture, recommender system issues, optimization issues um, worldwide uh, as, as we're colonized and cultivated by digitally transformed markets, entrepreneurs, uh, um, experiences, et cetera. Sorry for, for ranting, but I No, I no, no, that, that's very clear and that, that's, that's great. And you mentioned Netflix. I mean, maybe we can talk about a few case studies sure. here. So I guess Amazon seems like an obvious one to start with. So let me tell you about a failure that I have with, with Amazon. So I was doing this book, and at full disclosure, I've done a bit of consulting with Amazon. They're very, very smart people. I, you know, I, I have one of the great pleasures in life, as you well know, is getting to work with people who are smarter than you are. You know, it's just, it's just, it's, it's great. Um, that's a, a choice I freely and willingly not just make, but enjoy. So I had what I thought was, can I swear just a little bit? You on can, this? yeah. yeah I, I had what I thought was a fucking brilliant suggestion for Amazon that would cost them very little and, and potentially make them a lot. And it went nowhere. Let me tell you what it was. And it ties with the selves where element and aspect I explore in the recommender systems book. And, and that is, you know, I get recommendations for books. I get recommendations for clothes, et cetera. Why shouldn't Amazon give me an option for, here's the recommendation for reading for the curious Michael. Uh, here are the clothes for the fashion forward Michael, the take a chance Michael, that there are aspects and attributes of myself that just seem to show me what the choices are on this. To what extent do, do they do they overlap with the, forgive me, the centroid, average Michael? Now, I felt this was a no-lose for Amazon because first off, what portion of Amazon customers would want to explore recommendations for aspects of themselves? Is it one or two percent? Or is it 50 or 60 percent? You know, and is it one or two aspects of themselves or three or four aspects of themselves? Now imagine the data you would get, the recommendation. Oh, oh, by the way, do people, are they more likely to buy or less likely to buy when they see choices and opportunities that reflect aspects of themselves that they would, I, so you, you'll forgive me. I thought this was like a pun intended, not just a no lose, but a no brainer went nowhere. It went nowhere. As you can tell, because I'm whining about it here. But, but that was the thing, you know, goes right back to the beginning of our conversation about what's the difference between uh, um, being in the moment and taking a longer perspective of who you are and who you want to be. Because, because as much as I consider myself curious I, I am highly confident that if I ask for advice for my curious self from Expedia, from Spotify, by the way, Spotify had the Discover playlist, okay? They did that. That was one of their most, I mentioned that in the book, that's what was one of their most ex successful experiments, which is, which is, you know, here's what you really like, but Discover, we're going to expose you to bands and music that based on your preferences, we think you are likely to like. And, you know, you can choose to make it part, but, but this was the way to expose people to choose to expose yourself to novel music. Can I imagine this being done in, in your domain and finance? Of, of course, you know, this is a, 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 a category. This is a risk exposure. This is a novel asset. You know, this is a, a flavor of crypto that, that really, avoid some of the, you know, we'll call it the, the Bitcoin or the SBJ elements of the, of the, of the field. But, but you get the idea. I, I just felt that th these kinds of 
you know, be more innovative choice architects on this. Choice architecture requires choice architects. What are the materials for that architecture? How do we want to transform the notion of choice in terms of sequence, breadth, immediacy? Oh my gosh, I think these are the questions that matter most. And I thought Amazon would be a fantastic place for it, but. Now, if interest, why, why didn't they take up the idea? Did they oh, say? Oh God, they didn't give me a clue, but thank you. It's really interesting, Michael, thanks so much. Keep us in mind. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I mean, let's be fair. Maybe they were doing something like that. All I'm saying is, is when you really come to grips with the ab initio, the from fundamental elements of what is the future of choice, what is the future of architecture, what should the future of advice be, and how do you want to map it onto the future of yourself, your family, your career? Oh my gosh, the opportunities, I think, become really, really interesting for design and test and learning. And, and I, I think that is going to be one of the vectors, one of the trajectories, fine tuning and training of large language models will be on. Actually, while you sort of mentioned LLMs, um... You know, I've certainly used ChatGPT and asked it, you know, what should I do in this city? Give me an itinerary. And you could quite easily ask, I want to have a fun exactly. day like this. And so this seems like a big sort of paradigm shift that goes more, goes in the direction that you've been describing. I, I, I forgive you the Tom Cooney University of Chicago Press reference on paradigm shifts. But, but so here's the tweak that I've done on exactly what you've done, which I love, which is, Give me a tour of a city that appeals to an art lover that will surprise me along these dimensions, okay? So you, you, the prompts come with persona, not just with an item, you know, not just me. So, so again, we're, we're, we're expanding the boundaries of the self. We're reframing the notion of, of what a meaningful itinerary can be within these sorts of parameters versus those sorts of parameters. Let's be even more provocative. I want to, to be blown away, but I want the tour to not take more than 90 minutes on foot, okay? Now, you, you may end up with hallucination and other kinds of issues, but, but the notion here is, what kind of parameters and constraints can generate insight and innovation that might otherwise not exist? You look at poetry, there's haiku, there's limericks, there's Shakespearean sonnets, there's Petrarchian sonnets. These are constraints. What does creativity within constraints mean? Wow. Talk about choice architectures in, in, in that regard. Just, just for kicks, um, as a joke, and I'll send it to you afterwards. Um, I was joking with a friend about how, how I'm playing with prompts. And we, we, we were both Springsteen fans. And I said, wouldn't it be great if Bruce Springsteen wrote a song about prompts? And I actually asked ChatGPT, thank God the song was written decades ago, to write, Tramps Like Us, Baby We Were Born to Prompt. Write me a song about chat GPT born to prompt instead of born to run. It was, I'll send you, it was, again, forgive my vulgar language, it was pretty bloody good. Um, should, should Bruce perform it uh, at Wembley? Uh, probably not. But, but uh, if he did it if for a small group at Imperial College or Cambridge or Oxford, I think people would appreciate it. Yeah, I look forward to that one day. Uh, now, I did want to uh, have a little uh, move in a different direction. Sure. And this is based on one of your earlier pieces of work. You wrote a book called um, The Innovator's Hypothesis. And I, I wow. liked, this yes. is maybe a blast from the past for you, but I really do like, you know, the way you frame things. And, you know, maybe we can we can get into this by saying that you, you aren't a big fan of Harvard 
uh, business case, uh, the Harvard uh, Business School uh, case study approach to understanding businesses? Well, you know, some of my best friends are Harvard business people or what is it, the, the, the Judge School or Said in, yeah. in, in Oxford. Um, I, I, you mentioned Tom Kuhn, paradigm shifts. You know, Kuhn was a historian of science. He was also at Harvard. Um, I'm, I'm very interested in, I like Popper. I'm very interested in, in what is a, so we'll, we'll go back to the economics stuff. Science is a search for truth. Economics is a search for value. Truth and value are not inimical, but they're not the same thing. What are hypotheses we can design and test around truth, aka science, versus hypotheses we can design and test around value? Now, that can be economic policy or entrepreneurship, innovation. Um, I am interested in design of experiment as a way to cost effectively and swiftly and with, and I pick this phrase deliberately, higher confidence to uncover or discover the truth or uncover and discover hidden or open value. I would say that's a fundamental theme of my research and my work. And and what is what is an experiment? What is a recommendation? A recommendation is a hypothesis that you will like this, or you will find this of interest. Okay, it's a test. You, you may follow it. You may not. So so the whole notion of designing and testing hypotheses in in economic ways, in 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 scalable ways in insightful ways, this, this strikes me as a very, very important engine. We have, a, we have recommendation engines, we have inference engines, we have scientific engines. This, this strikes me as one of the ways human beings advance as individuals, as, as groups, as disciplines, as societies. So I'm a big, I'm a big fan of that, whether it's you know the Greeks, or whether it's the, the Chinese, or whether it's the West, you know, what are our engines for discovery? You know, and that's, I, I, yeah. How do we experiment? What, what are the experiments we should be considering to discover new truth and new value? That's a, that's a, that's a great way to end the main part of our conversation. Now I did want to uh, sure. pivot to some personal questions as well. Sure. One of which was, what's the best uh, investment advice you've ever received from anyone? You know, I, I, I'm going to, to say that, that I really didn't get very good investment advice. I've done well, but I think the most important things, it wasn't advice, it was discovering, it really was my shift into behavioral economics and discovering things like hyperbolic discounting. I, I found the Kahneman Tversky work, thinking fast and slow. Um, you know, what are the cognitive illusions that that, that you know, what are what are sunk costs? I, I mean, I'm 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 afraid that that did not happen until my 30s. So I, I would say that that was the the my quote investment uh, uh, epiphanies came when I started taking cognitive illusion and behavioral economics and behavioral finance uh, issues more seriously. The, okay. the, the legacy stuff I studied in, in university was way less helpful to me than, than I thought on, on this. Yeah. And I'm sorry. That's okay. And another question is, uh, some of our audience are, are relatively young, so they're at university, they're gonna leave university soon. What advice would you give them as they enter the real world? Um, I'm not going to say to thine own self be true. I, I will. I, I'll. Here's the advice that I wish that I had gotten 
when I left university. Always have the courage and the self-discipline to revisit the fundamentals. Because time and technology change the economics of the fundamentals in ways that create new opportunities you should be aware of and new risks you should be careful of. Take the fundamentals seriously. Um, don't assume away the fundamentals. That's a great, great piece of advice there. Now, another one, this is more selfish than anything else. Um, are there any techniques you have to increase your personal productivity? Because I imagine you must read around a lot. You have to write a lot. There's lots of information overload from different sources. Do you have any systems to just... I, I am not embarrassed to tell you that I am I, I do use chat GPT to think out loud. Okay. I have interesting arguments with chat GPT. Um again, which I'm happy to share with you. You know, I'm, I'm not blowing smoke. But if you were to ask me what heuristic I use that really does focus conversation and and saves time and and creates clarity that didn't exist before. It's I almost always ask myself and my my classes and my clients, not what do you want? What do you want the outcome to be? Describe the outcome that you want. And then I pay very close attention whether the outcome they're describing is an immediate one, a distant one, uh, is the motive for the desire for that outcome clear or obscured? So I, I find that to be a very useful, forgive me, cut to the quick question. I think it's very, very important. I'll give one last bit of quote unquote advice. You know, so obviously when I began teaching and doing research, I had a very clear vision of quote unquote the future. You know, what what here's where we need to go, blah, blah, blah. I'm ashamed to tell you, and when I say ashamed, I'm, I'm not exaggerating by much. Um, as important as it is to give people, to paint for people a, a, a desirable future, you have to begin with where people are. I would say one of my greatest failures as a human being, as a person, and as a thinking person is that I often gave, too often gave short shrift to where people really were or where they thought they were. You have to begin with where they are and you have to show them the respect and that you care about where they are as opposed to where you or they might like to be. And if I could go back in time and change certain professional or personal interactions, that would be the sensibility I would bring. No, that's great. Uh, great set of uh, pieces of advice there. Now, just to sort of round off the questions, um, are there, what major books that have influenced you? Oh my gosh, there are no shortage of books that that have have influenced me. Um, I, 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 that's almost an impossible. I, if if I showed you all the books that it, I, I, it, it, it's it's not just one book, and and I would suffer from, as Kahneman would say, recency bias yeah. on on some right. of this. Um, I, you know, I, I will say. That, that as I got older, I became less, well, I, I, I will say without hesitation, without giving the specific name, that during my adolescent years, the most important reading that I did in terms of influencing my adult life and adult decision was reading, I swear to God, science fiction. I mean, playing with scenarios of the future rooted in technology, rooted in the way people do or don't healthfully and unhealthfully interact with technology ha has had a huge impact on, on my life. So it's more of a genre than, than a particular book. You know, I, I wish I had been better in mathematics. I wish I had all, all, all manner of things. But in terms of my openness to playing with ideas and yes, revisiting the fundamentals, my engagement with science fiction was absolutely critical. Whether it, it was Ursula Le Guin, Harlan Ellison, Robert Heinlein, or Isaac Asimov, the oldies, but the goodies. 
Yeah, no, they're great, great writers. Um, now, what's the best way for people to follow you? Uh, I don't want people following me. I, I, <laughs> I, I think one of the smartest things that I've done as an adult is not be on social media. I would be, and I say this with no hesitation, if I were on social media, I would have been canceled and you would never have reached <laughs> out to me at, at, at this stage. Uh, the irony is that my brother, Elliot, was, was Sheryl Sandberg's first hire when she went from Google to Facebook. So my, my younger brother is the one you want investing in macro high. <laughs> great by willing to links to the books that you've authored uh that we've talked about on this uh on this podcast, i'd, I'd right? be delighted and i'm happy to connect with people on linkedin which is a safe professional in environment but you will never find me on x or twitter or instagram i i really don't want followers i i i like what we're having now a, a fun engaging conversation even if I have gone on a bit too long. So my apologies to you and your, your listeners. No, no, you've been, you've been fantastic and I've learned a lot. Uh, so, so with that, you know, thanks a lot for, for the really insightful conversation. And I would also recommend all listeners to, to buy uh, your books as well. You're, you're very kind. And I look forward to seeing a blip on my Amazon sales shortly on, on this. It was a real pleasure. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to the episode. Please subscribe to the podcast show on Apple, Spotify, or if you listen to podcasts, leave a five-star rating, a nice comment, and let other people know about the show. We'd be super grateful. Finally, sign up for our free newsletter at macrohive.com forward slash free. That's macrohive.com forward slash free. We'll be back soon, so tune in then.